there is a saying that money can buy happiness, but can it buy health? Can it save lives? Sickness, premature mortality are a huge burden on individuals, on the whole communities, and on the whole countries. They are important, and yet they are not always considered when policies and interventions are being developed. In our today's final plenary session, our presenters will explore factors driving effective change and benefits that can be delivered. We will also discuss the importance of economic factors in harm reduction initiatives and in delivering significant benefits to communities. So let me um, uh, invite our first speaker, David McIntosh from United Kingdom. David has worked both at national, regional and civic levels um, at the city of London. He led the work of the London Drug and Alcohol Policy Forum for all, uh, almost 20 years was involved in assessing the threat of methamphetamine and supported the Healthy and Safer Nightlife of Youth project. His work on improving the safety in the nighttime economy is considered the best practice guidelines in the UK and has informed the international work. David, please. Thank you very much for that. Uh very generous introduction. Um, okay, so. And I click. Okay, so this is going to be a very sort of personal reflection, really, on some of the issues and initiatives that I have been aware of, that I've worked with, or even helped um, promote. Now, for a, a variety of reasons, a lot of issues connected with harm reduction in particular are often quite unpopular. Um, and I'm going to have a look at, you know, some of the factors that I think, and I repeat, this is a very personal view, have allowed the investment and resources to allow progress. And at the end, I will uh, reflect on what I think are some of the lessons that can be learned. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this slide. Now, we've heard quite a lot about HIV um, over the last two days. Uh, this is very much looking at the experience in the UK. Things started at a very small level, and I think it's important that in the context of what I'm talking about, there's, there's some background that's important. We saw a massive increase in injecting drug use into the 1980s. Uh, and as an example, just as a very small case study, in Edinburgh, uh, a city with a population of just over 400,000, in the 1970s, there, there were less than 100 injecting drug users in that city. By the mid-1980s, that had risen to over 5,000. That trend was reflected across the UK. And at the same time, we had the advent of AIDS, which I don't think you can exaggerate the effect that that had um, on, on, on people. You know, uh, a new disease, an unknown disease, people didn't really understand much about how it was spread. Uh, but in 1985, there were 275 cases of AIDS in the UK, with 144 deaths recorded in the same year. The projections looking forward, the estimates, were nothing less than frightening. And it did frighten policymakers and politicians. And although there had been some small initiatives, uh, and I should credit uh, the Netherlands for this, they sort of gave the idea to some people to set up some of the first needle exchanges. What we had up to that point were really small scale. We were talking about one or two projects helping maybe a few hundred people in the entire UK. But the government became concerned. And despite this attitude that did exist, and I think applies to a lot of harm reduction cases, which is, why are you going to spend all this time, money and attention on these people? You know, why are we concerned at that time? There were politicians who went on the record and said, why are we concerned about gay people? Why are we concerned about drug addicts? We were fortunate at the time that we had a health minister and some other senior politicians 
who uh, had some bravery, recognised the importance, and said, we are going to do something. Um, and they were helped by experts. There was a very important expert input. There was a, a report produced by the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs, which is a body that advises the government. They produced a report in 1988, AIDS and Drug Misuse. And I'm going to quote from the front page of that report. HIV is a greater threat to public and individual health than drug misuse. That was pretty strong stuff of what was, you know, a very official document. And that did basically see harm reduction uh, adopted. And it wasn't just about need exchange. The same report also recommended uh, or highlighted the importance of substitute prescribing. And so I start off talking about the, the mid 1980s, uh, but that investment in policy, in political bravery, in money back then, you can still see the return on that investment, if I can use that phrase now, because okay, the UK was quite early to the harm reduction table, Australia were even quicker. If you look at HIV prevalence rates amongst people who inject drugs now, Australia, it's 1%. In the UK, about 1.5. North America, where there was a lot of resistance to harm reduction, still is, uh, to needle exchanges, no federal money for needle exchanges, that figure rises to 9%. If you look to Eastern Europe, it comes up to nearly 25%. In some countries, it's in excess of that. So I think that's a clear indication, if you like, of the value of that investment. But of course, it's not just health that motivates action. Um, and if we move into the 1990s, when I started uh, working in central government on drug, issue, on drug issues, there was a big focus on crime. And this was one of the big drivers for investment. There was a, a new government came in 1997, um, and they've been very clear that they were going to concentrate on driving down crime. Uh, there's a quote here you will see that came from the prime minister at the time, half of all property crime is committed by drug addicts. Um, this would be a statement that is not necessarily well supported by facts, but it was a powerful political statement, and it did help provide more money for a massive expansion in the UK drug treatment sector. We also had some research that showed the return on that investment. You see there that I've quoted the figure, every pound spent in treatment saves three pounds. I can say that in official documents alone, that figure varies from two pounds to 12 pounds 50, depending on what year it was done, by which department and possibly with determine which outcome was desired. But the fact is it was never disputed that there was a good return on investment, which did help bring a lot of money into the system. We, we doubled the treatment capacity of the UK drug treatment system in only a few years. And that obviously provided great health benefits for people, but there was a, the driver, it wasn't about improving individual or even public health. A lot of that money was coming to help drive down crime rates. Did it work? Well, access to treatment definitely improved and crime rates fell over the period of that investment, but very hard to prove that the investment in drug treatment directly contributed to the drop in crime, but it's probably a reasonable assumption. And there was a slight risk there actually, or a slight problem. And that there was a, in the UK, there was a degree of complacency. People thought the problem had been addressed and political interest, and then the money was withdrawn in the financial crisis, saw a loss of investment. And as I say there, a loss of leadership, and that led to, I think, directly a big increase in drug-related deaths. Oh, go back. Okay. So I'm not going to dwell on this too long, but you can see that is a huge, huge difference. And just to quote, you know, figure in 1997, 
uh, death rates, uh, drug related death rates were 54 per million. The last year we reported 84.4 million, um, which I think is a disgrace, but does show that um, you can have got a good system, but when you stop paying attention to it, things do get worse. Moving on, I want to look at hepatitis C. 20 years of frustration nearly on my part here because some of the first meetings I was involved in was in what was then seen as a relatively new problem uh, that was cropping up with people who injected drugs around hepatitis C. The contrast between the responses to HIV and hep C could not have been greater. There was very little public information. There was no consistent testing campaign. Um, it was very hard to encourage sort of outreach programs to reach people who weren't yet using needle exchanges. We did have some activists. We had some very good activists. Um, there was some lobbying, but there was a real lack of political interest. And I think that was partly because it was seen as quite a distant problem. Uh, as some of you will know, hep C often only the symptoms often start to emerge 20 or more years after people may have contracted. And no one quite knew what to do to solve the problem. Um, and this would be a case where the pharmaceutical industry did rise to the rescue. Uh, we started seeing some new drugs emerge around 2014, which at that time were tremendously expensive. But actually in the UK and some other countries, there was negotiation to bring the price down. And then there was something that I'll come back to uh, at the end. Suddenly we had the ability to promote, to promote a competition. If you were running a city, for example, London, you didn't want to be one of the last places in the country to be trying to eliminate hepatitis C. And hepatitis C elimination is possible if you put the right programs in place. Uh, and in the UK, uh, an honourable mention uh, should go to the small city of Dundee in Scotland, where uh, a small group of people got together and did effectively achieve elimination very quickly. And that, I could almost use the word embarrassed other leaders to go, we better get on board and do this as well. Um, okay. Right, alcohol. Okay. Um, alcohol, huge cost, about 21 and a half billion. Uh, is the anticipated cost of uh, estimated cost in the UK. We have done very little in some respects. We don't have a coherent alcohol strategy. We have started to um, have some small scale harm reduction approaches, uh, managed alcohol programs, alcohol recovery centers. We have had some success around improving public health involvement in a licensing which has seen a reduction in people arriving uh, a and &E after they have drunk too much. But considering 21 and a half billion cost, 10,000 deaths a year compared to 4,000 or so for drugs, a remarkable lack really of political interest and focus. And I have to be very grateful to the UK government for uh, making an announcement just before uh, this conference on smoking. Um, now, smoking dwarfs the depths of everything else that I've spoken about. Around 76,000 UK citizens a year die due to smoking. The costs, around 17 billion, it's estimated. We've done a good job in the UK of reducing overall smoking rates, apart from in the most vulnerable, uh, poorest communities, groups where people have poor mental health. And those those groups are not reducing their smoking rates very fast at all. So that's partly why you've seen um, the announcement uh, that the government's just made about um, providing uh, one million smokers, that's one in five smokers in the UK, with support to switch to vaping. This is quite ambitious, it's quite politically brave, um, but it shows actually the government's commitment to try to meet its 2030 uh, smoke-free targets and address health inequalities. And they have got on board with that in a way which I think is in some ways quite surprising, but is quite admirable. 
And finally, my thoughts on what's made things work over the years. Pilot projects and activists are really essential because they prepare the ground. They do things that you can replicate. They make some, they, they raise the volume of it. Human stories exposing the people who make decisions to real people affected by these problems helps overcome prejudice. Evidence and science is essential, but in my experience, very rarely enough on its own. Um, it does matter to identify uh, the gains for individual and public health. A value for money uh, argument always works well with those people who work in your treasury department. But convincing the policymakers and the politicians of what can be achieved and successes um, that they can be associated with, that's where the big wins are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. And let me say that among the many impressive figures that you have mentioned, uh, let me quote one non-figure thing that you said. It takes bravery from politicians, from politicians to do something useful. Yeah. Uh, I would now like to invite our next presenter, uh, Kentra Gintautas Yousas, a cardiologist, deputy chairman of the council and a member of the expert council of the Densaulik. Uh, Kentra has a unique experience, including, among many others, managing several medical services uh, for prison organizations. And, well, those who work with prisons know that it's uh, a world in its own. Um, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I will do the presentation in... Uh... Reduction and as the subject, this is the harm reduction and the problems related to the counterfeited goods and the economic factor also should be taken into account. So first of all, why this problem is so relevant and why the NCDs are given such a high priority? We all know that the prevailing diseases which lead to the premature death this is a cardiovascular diseases, the respiratory system diseases, diseases and uh, mortality caused by strokes and uh, infarcts and uh, diabetes and uh, cancer diseases they hold the first place and unfortunately these numbers are increasing and uh, it may seem that the physiologically death is a continuation of life but in fact uh, Numbers show that the NCD mortality cases are getting younger. And according to the WHO data, we have about 15 million people dying every year in age from 30 up to 69, while the 40 million of mortality cases fall under NCDs. And those 15 million people, these are those citizens who are of active age, should be, in fact, contributing to the development of the country, live and enjoy the life. Unfortunately, they are uh, uh, living for the better world. Uh, and what these are the cardiovascular diseases, respiratory diseases, diabetes, and the oncology. So these are the four groups within the NCD category. And what are the reasons? This is tobacco smoking, hyperdynamia, the abuse of alcohol, and unhealthy nutrition, uh, meaning disbalanced nutrition. Today we discussed a lot of different subjects uh, separately, and we discussed the consequences. Uh, uh, and what are the reasons of the NCDs, what are the causes of NCDs, but we uh, combine them a little bit because we work on harm reduction for all NCDs and we have uh, organized them by major groups. And in Kazakhstan, we have a high 
percentage of mortality cases from NCDs in 2009, but at that point, we had 18.5 18, uh, 18 million population, so these numbers are quite high. If we check the statistics in blood circulation diseases, hold 36%, 22% of all under the respiratory diseases, 15 for the oncology, and if to speak about such reasons as the car accidents, road accidents, injuries, it made up 10%. So the overwhelming majority of mortality cases fall under the chronic diseases. And we have the double two statistics, which was presented in 2019 for Kazakhstan. And the current burden of NCDs is 4.5 percentage of GDP in Kazakhstan. So the loss is huge. And uh, once again, I would like to repeat, uh, these are the main NCD-related factors and uh, caused by tobacco smoking and uh, also bad nutrition, alcohol whole abuse uh, and there is a global trend uh, this is a reproductive culture and uh, drug dependence and uh, which factor unites all these aspects these are different types of dependencies. If you have a look at the drug dependence, then you you understand the problem more deeper. But we have nicotine dependence, and we have uh, nutrition-associated dependence, like dependence on sugar-contained products. And uh, why it is so challenging to fight with dependence? Because in addition to physical dependence, we have psychological dependence developed alongside. We are not stress-free. Uh, these are very stressful times. And the epoch and any stress may take you back to the nicotine dependence. Yes, we can use uh, some uh, pharmaceutical support to quit smoking for certain percentage but then because of the stressful scenarios, people tend to come back to the tobacco practice uh, or again uh, it is challenging to keep the diet if the person has developed the sugar dependence. And if you look at harm reduction concept, in fact, in this strategy, we work on the lifestyle because 62% of our health outcomes depends on the lifestyle. So 20%, this is for genetics and the rest for the quality of uh, health quality services. But the half of it depends on the lifestyle and the harm reduction principle this is to protect and to respect human rights, uh, adherence to the social justice, and uh, also fighting with discrimination and stigma elimination. If one of those principles is not observed, that means that we are preventing the person to arrive successfully to the healthy lifestyle. So what are the tools at our disposal? So these are the evidence-based less harmful products. So this should be evidence-based, uh, science-based. Yes, we have such products for replacement. For example, let's start with the drug dependence. And we know that harm reduction has initiated with the syringe and ex uh, needles exchange with the distribution of condoms. And then MIT arrived, and then Kazakhstan it is used, and there are positive results produced. It leads to decriminalization less of crimes are committed, people are coming back to the society and to their families, so, and they, it is more cost-efficient, uh, even though the methadone is provided for free, but still, it is still very cost-efficient uh, because people start working and paying taxes. With uh, nicotine and with tobacco, this is a uh, more recent uh, phenomena in terms of the substitution therapy, and more and more studies uh, show that the nicotine replacing uh, options 
uh, non so smoke free options as it was already discussed at the previous session this is uh, replacements like gadgets like e-cigarettes uh, which should be used uh, only among those who cannot or who do want to quit it also can be accepted as a harm reduction too and the within nutrition field it is also challenging you know to find proper replacement or substitution because uh, nutrition it's not like a narrow list of products when by excluding which we can uh, or by replacing which we can improve the healthy results uh, but this is about the reduced consumption of salts and sugars and uh, sweetened beverages and this is a proper balance of the carbohydrates and proteins and uh, and this is uh, complicated because of the you know cuisine tra and traditional dietary habits and most importantly it's very important to work with the consumers by shifting consumers to the less harmful options so each drug may be, uh, you know, beneficial or harmful. It may kill or it may kill, as we know from ancient times. And that's why it's important to explain to the healthy population and to all patients uh, what are those uh, few steps that you can undertake personally to reduce uh, both uh, morbidity and mortality. And thus, acting like that we can have this harmful reduction effect achieved but if no actions are undertaken then the ncd curve will be only aggravating because we are living at the epoch of progressive technologies and our lifestyle is more and more detrimental to health and uh, prohibition is a very short term tool in terms of its efficiency for example in the us and soviet union when the alcohol products have been banned it didn't work as a long-term measure yes it, it produces some short-term impact but then it will you know fire you back with uh, smuggled goods so, so if you ignore harm reduction strategy in fact you don't make any savings and what is the economy uh, situation so we have conducted the study in 2019 and here you can see the amounts in tenge in kazakh uh, currency and in red color you can see you say health related expenses to control ncds and if there are no measures applied then starting from 2019 we can see the forecasted dynamics for the next 10 years over the recent 10 years is this is about 609 billion tenge, and from all the sources like nutrition, tobacco smoking, alcohol abuse, and drug dependence. So we have not included the low physical activity and other factors because of the lack of statistics but we've uh, generated good data based on those four causes and uh, based on that we can see that there is a dramatic impact if we apply the harm reduction strategy and uh, the profit uh, the savings will be 387 billion tenge, which is about 1 billion USD over 10 years so for today this is 19.5 million the size of the population and that's why this amount of 1 billion USD is quite tangible for the budget. And of course there are certain risks and uh, dangers that we will really have to fight so these are uh, counterfeited and smuggled uh, products because uh, this compromises the significance of the harm reduction concept for example if you uh, introduce uh, restrictions uh, to let's say to chewing gums uh, 
is we, to, for example, the chigams which use uh, sugar as substitution, but in the production cycle, this is the most expensive ingredient. It is much cheaper to use regular sugar, and then it's it may not be either harmful or healthy, but if we take the diabetes patient, then it becomes risky for his or her health. And also talking about other products where they should be using sugar substitutions, then you see in its totality, it may become quite dangerous for the diabetes patients. At the world market, there are studies made, and also in Kazakhstan, we do the analysis, and in Kazakhstan, we have just the same trends as globally. We have counterfeited products, including personal equipment protection, e-cigarettes, supplements, drugs, so there, are, there is no any type of product which hasn't been counterfeited or uh, was uh, or has escaped you know the improper inappropriate production but now this uh, indicators are even aggravated due to certain political reasons and now we have increased the flow of goods going via kazakhstan to russia uh, and this is a flow of counterfeited goods which is uh, left to certain extent within kazakhstan as well if you take the customs data, the counterfeited goods, goods they make an amount of from 300 up to 600 billion USD per year, and this is only the amount of counterfeited goods which have been seized, and it's more even gigantic if to speak about the total amount of counterfeited goods so because we are trying to communicate to the government uh, the challenges we've been facing and because of the customs regulations and seizures of counterfeited goods is a governmental function and the government should be doing this uh, uh, control efficiently but still we are having a lot of counterfeited goods uh, showing up at the market and therefore our task includes uh, the public awareness activities because people sometimes uh, prefer to buy cheaper products which may look externally as original products but could be harmful and on the photo you can see the products uh, detected by our organization uh, you can see uh, uh, well-known uh, you know labels maybe only one letter has been changed but it's not known where it was produced and we have uh, identified intestinal bacteria uh, on some in some of the products and a lot of failures to meet the requirements so what we can do in order to increase the public awareness first of all we should implement the comprehensive set of activities and the government should be motivating certain activities and also we should be using communication channels such as tv radio internet web pages and uh, educational and training activities uh, starting from kindergartens and uh, schools in order to communicate these messages to younger generations and to their parents because when it comes to vaping uh, because now children start smoking and uh, parents may not be aware of the harmful effects of vapor machines and would sometimes buy themselves these devices to their children. So you can see the high relevance of this uh, a subject and so that's why we should be working with, with the population by using all types of communications uh, because we shall not rely only on the governmental mechanisms uh, to fix the problem and this uh, this becomes obvious when you have a look at the goods on the market thank you very much for another excellent presentation and for highlighting multiple factors behind the burden of NCDs. 
and uh, well, the importance of looking holistically at the effects which are behind it. Um, professor Frederick Nystrom is our next presenter. He's a professor of internal medicine and endocrinology at the Linköping University in Sweden. He is also the chief physician of internal medicine in his clinic, where he primarily treats patients with diabetes and those who are overweight. Frederick's research revolves around drinking and smoking, two activities that are so frequently performed together and so rarely researched jointly. Frederick. Sorry? Yes, can we start with the film, please? Trots att alla vet att rökning är mycket skadligt och att länder världen över infört en rad regleringar för att bekämpa rökning för att få människor att inte börja så har världen idag över en miljard rökare. Men svenskar använder nikotin i ungefär lika hög utsträckning som europeer i allmänhet. Men vi röker i låg utsträckning. Hur går det ihop? Jo, Sverige har en tradition sedan 1700-talet av att använda mald och kryddad tobak under läppen, alltså snus. Om fler länder skulle gå den svenska vägen att låta de som vill använda nikotin att göra det på det minst skadliga sättet vi känner till så skulle många liv kunna sparas. Fantastic. That was me speaking a special Swedish dialect from southeast Sweden, Örskötska. Yes. So can I get my slides? Great. So <clears throat> this is a couple of slides not showing any of my actual data. They're very small, but anyhow. So this is uh, the smoking prevalence decreasing uh, in firstly Norway. Norway, Norwegians are also allowed to use this snus as presented in the movie uh, because they're not part of the European community. And uh, from, two, from a, since uh, the last about 20 years, you can see that smoking in all ages has declined considerably in, in uh, Norway, while the use of snuff or sorry, snus has increased pretty much proportionally. And this was the same apparently in young people being displayed here, but not really exactly the same in men and women. Uh, women are still using uh, snus to somewhat lower prevalence than, than in males, but there is the same tendency for both genders to replace uh, smoking with snus. Uh, and these are the corresponding Swedish figures, <clears throat> which are pretty much the same simply. So, so in Sweden now, uh, we are supposedly smoke free, the blue part of, of the figure here being around 5%. Uh, overall, according to a couple of year old uh, figures, while smoking prevalence, according to this survey, is something like 15%. Um, and is again, as I said, it's the same difference between men and women, women in Sweden, and it's pretty much the same pattern in young people that they are replacing cigarettes with, with snooze. So the question is then, is this more pure form of nicotine from the snus, which can even be white snus as we call it, which is completely tobacco free? Uh, is that as harmful as cigarettes? And to give you the answer very shortly, no, it's absolutely not. And I tried to prove that in a quite unique, I've learned afterwards, wasn't really aware of that when I designed the trial, a trial of the acute effects of nicotine. So I, <clears throat> did a pretty simple layout. Uh, this is from the actual uh, publication in drug and alcohol dependence. Uh, so we had 14 subjects being enrolled, seven healthy women and have seven healthy males, pretty young ones, all actually medical students that were simply randomized to eating a McDonald Big Mac from McDonald uh, together with a a triple chocolate cookie, I think it's called, lots of sugar. Uh, and that was to test the acute effects of nicotine or alcohol actually uh, in this combined trial uh, on insulin and glucose regulation. 
So in short, all the 14 participants came to my experimental ward. And uh, the, one, the one time, uh, no, sorry, after one hour after the baseline tests had been drawn, and also after which basal metabolic rate had been recorded. So we recorded oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide uh, uh, exhalation, <laughs> so in, in the breath. So we actually measured the total amount of metabolic rate every hour. And every hour we also measured insulin, glucose, and lots of hormones. And the one after the baseline test uh, of all these things that we measured, all the participants had to eat this McDonald's Big Mac together with a triple chocolate cookie. And then we took tests every hour uh, until about noon. And there were four conditions then. So there were two deciliters of red wine together with the Big Mac and the cookie uh, with alcohol on two occasions. And on the two other occasions, it was red wine without any alcohol. And also they replaced snooze every hour and the snooze was either with or without nicotine. So all the participants came four times to the investigation. It was over 56 experiments in 14 subjects. Did you get that? So that gives you the advantage of comparing both effects of alcohol and of nicotine together with the meal and also actually uh, the acute effects of the snooze since the first snooze portion was placed just after the baseline measurement. So the first hour before they get the meal is actually only the comparison of nicotine in snooze or snooze without nicotine. So these are the main graphs displaying to you, hopefully understandably, uh, the effects on some chosen um, parameters. These are actually all the data from the areas under the curves, which is the correct statistical way to analyze the differences between these different conditions. But anyhow, after one hour <coughs> with snoops under the lip, there was a slight increase, I'll show you a separate figure of that after this one, in metabolic rate. So you did consume a little bit more energy, which supposedly could help in weight loss when having nicotine containing snoops under the lip. While there was no effect once you had taken the meal with or without the alcohol in the red wine, uh, there were no changes at all in glucose levels, which was pretty surprising for those who think that nicotine should affect insulin resistance or causing diabetes and so on. In this very strict situation, condition, there was no changes between having nicotine or not under, under the lip following the meal or even acutely before getting any food at all. <clears throat> and the, one, the small changes we did see that were induced by the nicotine was the hormone cortisol, which is a well-known stress hormone that in short term could help you increase focus and attention and so on that was slightly higher during nicotine under the lip or compared to using a snooze without any nicotine. And also, which I'm not showing here graphically, there was a slight increase in blood pressure, say something like three millimeters of mercury while having nicotine in the snooze uh, compared to no nicotine in the snooze. So in short, there were very little that happened with any major metabolic or hormones except for the cortisol increase, which goes hand in hand and, and suits with the fact that people do tend to feel more focused when they use nicotine in any form, according to other people's trials. So this is just uh, the larger pictures of the, all the participants and all the conditions uh, showing, not perhaps so convincingly, but it is statistically significant, a small increase in the total metabolic rate at resting when having nicotine under the lip. Anyhow, this is <coughs> the slight increase. Some increase a lot and some in don't increase that very much, but it's of interest from a metabolic point of view and could be some factor that uh, is in line with the fact that people tend to increase in body weight when they stop smoking and that body weight increase is lessened if you use, for example, snooze when you quit your smoking. And I can't help Kentra, I'm sorry, <laughs> to show you the thing. Also one picture of what happened with alcohol and red wine, because for me as a di uh, 
scientists mainly actually studying obesity and diabetes and, and cardiovascular risk factors, there was an increase in metabolic rate by the alcohol in red wine. And in particularly interesting, I think I found that the uh, appetite increasing hormone ghrelin was strongly suppressed by red wine with alcohol, which goes uh, hand in hand with other trials I've done in which a lot of red wine to people in randomized trial did not increase body weight. So, but that was not a part of really thought as a main topic here today. We should switch to what's happened from an epidemiological point of view in Sweden, according to official data. And very much in short, during this period of time in which we have swapped sort of in a great epidemiological uh, trial, occurring more or less spontaneously, partly because of the legislation that we kept snooze within EU in Sweden. There has been absolutely no increase in ischemic heart disease among men who swapped from, uh, fr from smoking tobacco to using snooze. There is an extremely low prevalence of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease among males in Sweden who don't smoke anymore, almost at all. And in particular for Swedish concern is that there is actually no increase that can be seen epidemiologically that there would be an effect to induce lip and oral cavity cancer by snooze as far as I can find as, and as far as this present uh, quite new epidemiolog epidemiological data support. So in summary, switching source of nicotine from smoking to using snooze is I believe an exceptional method for harm reduction at population level as seen in the Swedish and Norwegian examples and experiences. And according to my acute trial, the nicotine per se is quite harmless. There's a very small, sorry, I have one more slide off that was, I think, uh, the increase in blood pressure is on par or even slightly less with that from coffee. And similarly to coffee, the metabolic rate increases when the stimul stimulation from nicotine takes hold. And it's likely linked with increased focus and attention that also follows use by using coffee or using nicotine and both at the same time. And this increase in metabolic rate would also be helpful to avoid an increase in body weight. And I show this slide last. Epi were the ones getting me here. Thanks for that. Environmental and Public Health Institute, a think tank that addresses environmental and public health threats of our time. And I might get questions of the funding of the trial and they were pretty much just funded by funds that I happen to have from both the County Council of Östergötland, which is where I work as a physician and in particular from the Faculty of Medicine where, where I am head of internal medicine. Yeah, I think my time is passed. Perfect, thank you. Thank you very much for presenting something that I call Swedish wonder of practically replacing uh, smoking with uh, safer, uh, safer means of, of nicotine delivery. Uh, our, um, next, uh, our next presenter today um, is uh, Sergei Sosnikov, who is a vice rector for the international affairs at Bukhara State Medical Institute in Uzbekistan. Among many act activities, he worked as a monitoring expert in international projects, as an assistant professor, and within a Fulbright grant as a visiting researcher at the, uh, at the Central Michigan University in USA. He developed and led mathematical modeling healthcare department, uh, sorry, mathematical modeling in healthcare department, and then served uh, at the Department of Research and Planning uh, in the Federal Public Health Research Institute. Thank you very much for introduction, but I'm uh, actually already ex-vice rector and I'm serving as assistant professor now. And I'm in my, uh, the field that I prefer most of all to conduct the research, to teach and to do the things that I love to do. And today I want to introduce you one experimental study that I provided to Uzbekistan and to uh, Kyrgyzstan numbers. And the name of the study is the indirect economic cause of HIV and AIDS. Uh, can you please switch your slides? Uh, thank you, sorry. 
So I want to ask you, do not cheat it and do not use it in your practice because it's just preliminary data. And I did this research especially for this conference. And I hope that I will continue this research and it will become a scientific paper. And I invite everyone to join me and to give me any critics and to provide me any uh, information. So we have a different approach to calculate the indirect cost of illness. And I decide to go to uh, through the disability adjusted life years approach because I was involved in the global burden of disease study for already seven years. And I was an expert for post Soviet countries and I provide a lot of data and expertise as well as some variables and other things to this study. So I have, um, uh, I, I can use this data and that's why I choose it. But first of all, let's take a look uh, what kind of ill, uh, what kind of cost of illness can we uh, calculate using just open data, right? That's available to everyone, to any researchers. Uh, of course, it's uh, uh, try to you can try to calculate indirect cost of illness because direct cost of illness it's actually most of all, mostly the healthcare expenditures. And this data, I mean, direct cost of illness is available only for policymakers, for Ministry of Health, for special agencies. And uh, of course, it's a, uh, one of the ways to calculate the burden of disease calculated in money, but uh, you have to have access to special databases and it's mostly complicated for researchers like I who work who like to work with the open data. So what is the indirect cost of illness? Mostly it is a, a human capital uh, deflection. It is a social consequences and productivity losses. How can we uh, calculate, uh, for example, human capital uh, depletion? So this is the years, uh, uh, years of life lost. The years of life lost, uh, it's a term that we indicate uh, the death rates of the population that was attributable to those on these any uh, risk factors or, or just cause of disease or uh, other, other ways when we lose people uh, according to the death of people. And we have another variable, actually years of life with disability because not only death can be the main outcome of the disease, of the harmless, uh, use of some substances or other uh, things that can affect life of people. So what is the years lived with disability? So for example, people lose a leg in the road accident and he will uh, definitely, he can continue his life until the average uh, age of life of the people in this country, but he will live with disability. He, he cannot continue his regular life. He cannot uh, go to work and earn enough money for his live, or, or even if he earn enough money, it will be a pension. So we calculate the years that people spend with disability to the average uh, continuous of the life in this region or country as the years who this person live with disability. So uh, these two variables give us opportunity to, uh, to, to calculate the disability adjusted life years. It is ELDs plus uh, years with life uh, lost, years of life with disability plus years of life lost. So that we can get DALIs. And this indicator is very comprehensive indicator. It cal calculates not only the number of deaf people, but also the people who live with disability. And we calculate it not in the uh, actual numbers of the people, but we calculate how many years each of these person lost. And on population level, how many years we lost on the epidemiological uh, way of thinking. And of course, uh, so I already told you about the data sources, but let me, uh, not, not at all, but let me be more clear. So we, I took the DALIs that I explained on the previous slide from the Global Burden of Disease Study. It is available for everyone and I can provide the links 
So, so it was calculated for 356 diseases and conditions for most of the country of the world. So I took this variable uh, for the Kyrgyzstan and for, uh, for Uzbekistan from the Global Burden of Disease Study. Uh, I used the gross domestic product per capita variable, uh, GDP per capita private, from the World Bank uh, development indicators. I took the life expectancy data from World Bank development indicators, uh, and I took the value of statistical life, VSL, and remember this abbreviation because I will come to it uh, many times in this uh, presentation. So the VSL for Uzbekistan as well as for other countries was calculated by uh, KIP uh, Viscusi in 2017. And I took it from their scientific publication. So how I conduct the data analysis? Well, uh, let me show it on the next slides. But first of all, I want to provide some basic information. And I will be, I promise that I will not provide any formulas in this presentation. I will not torture you with formulas. So uh, in Kyrgyz Republic, actually, uh, to the um, 2019 year, uh, the average life, life expectancy was 67 years for men. and. Six, uh, 76 men, years for women and for women and the population was 7 million people and I took these numbers as a basic numbers for next calculations for Republic of Uzbekistan the population was in 2019 36 million people and the life expectancy was pretty similar but a little bit uh, more actually for both sexes men and women it was one year more than for in, in Kyrgyzstan then uh, I took uh, the Dalis, as I said uh, before, and actually I include to the HIV losses, health losses, not only the losses from directly HIV death rates or disabilities. I also include, for example, um, uh, the result in, in uh, how HIV results in other diseases because the main cause of death can, not, can be not only HIV and for example, tuberculosis. And tuberculosis affected by HIV can be cause of death and it can calculate it and coded in the, uh, in, as, a, as a cause of death as a tuberculosis, but it was affected by HIV. So I took also other variables that was um, relevant to HIV. And this is the whole, uh, pathway of the research, and I will take first step. And as I said, there is two ways to calculate these uh, numbers. I mean, economical uh, economical burden. First of all, is from the uh, I took the value of statistical life from on the left side on the left column from the this paper, and the second using GDP. And let me do not go to the details and go further because the most fruitful and interesting thing, I mean, the numbers is on the next slide. So using the cost of the one year life that was calculated from the cost of whole life that was published in that paper and using the gross domestic product per person, I applied, multiplied on DALIs from HIV and related diseases and uh, the burden, economical burden, uh, uh, was, divide, was uh, from the multiplication of Dalis on the cost of one year of life. So that I received two numbers. Uh, actually, the left number, okay, thank you. The left number was, uh, uh, the, is a, was produced uh, from the gross domestic product account of life. And the right number, was calculated using the uh, value of statistical life from that publication, that research from the previous uh, publications. So we have 55 millions plus 55 and a half millions burden in Uzbekistan from HIV and related to HIV diseases. It's a lower, uh, lower expectation and high expectation is three times high. It's 164 millions and a half. It's based on another way of calculation. So we even can go further. We can calculate it in males. We can calculate it in females. 
and we can go further. And I did it in uh, because I respect our uh, conference hosts and did it for Kyrgyzstan too. So we have in Kyrgyzstan based on a uh, value of statistical life and the cost and the burden, economical burden from HIV in Kyrgyzstan in 2019 was 17 million and 800 thousand dollars us dollars so i think my time is us but i want just a couple of words say about the future uh, implementations of this research we also can uh, calculate the numbers attributable to other risk factors for example i already done some calculations for um just a second okay uh for uh, whole HIV burden as well. I can I did it for drug use as a risk factor for HIV because in global burden of disease we have the list for other risk factors and HIV has its own risk factors. So the drug use as a risk factor for HIV calculated in money in US dollars took a half of whole economical burden in the Uzbekistan and. Uh, a little bit more in Kyrgyzstan. So uh, I will be very pleased if you will provide me any questions, but I have to stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a great presentation, which in a way very nicely mirrors uh, the approach presented by Kentra on NCDs, while yours was a holistic view on the HIV AIDS. Uh, our final speaker today is uh, Kurban Bayeva Gulnar, uh, who is a deputy head of the expert group on, on entrepreneurship under the Interdepartmental Commission on Entrepreneurship Development of the Government of Kazakhstan. Uh, Gulnar also serves as a deputy head of the Civil Alliance of uh, Kazakhstan, which is an umbrella organization for NGOs. Please. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. As it has been said, there, this is the final presentation uh, at uh, this uh, wonderful event, the City Health uh, Conference, uh, and uh, it uh, places certain responsibility on me that uh, we are uh, uh, for us to remember that this conference was uh, amazing yesterday and the same uh, wonderful uh, spirit of today. And I would like to thank the host for inviting me to take part at this conference. Uh, my status and my work is uh, related to public health uh, the least, but uh, nonetheless, I would like to thank the host for the opportunity to have exposure to the statistical uh, records, uh, to research uh, researches and uh, case studies as the expert who is engaged in a state regulatory policy. This kind of material is a justification, serves so as a rationale to make proposals, uh, to make amendments to the applicable laws and the legislation to improve the situation in uh, our countries uh, when it comes uh, to reducing the uh, rate of the problems and challenges. Um, this is to do with uh, reducing the risks uh, of risks, uh, risk factors uh, of NCDs and also implementing the concept of harm reduction. OK, let us start. Uh, uh, in this uh, uh, collection of uh, studies and uh, figures, and uh, my colleague Kentras has shared uh, huge uh, statistical figures, I would like to focus your attention, uh, which are essential for uh, decision making. So we have conducted some researches historically. We started uh, that the uh, the beautiful uh, team of Bahit Niazbekovna, you have uh, uh, met her yesterday. Uh, yesterday she started the first panel discussion. Uh, we have uh, started uh, the studies uh, on harm reduction and the effects of harm reduction, and it was adopted by government agencies. Officially, it was not uh, approved, and it was the basis for a, a whole range of uh, studies and researches. Uh, very briefly. Um, uh, 
uh, except for the presentation of uh, Mr. Soshnikov, uh, will be disseminated among the participants. And briefly, I would like uh, to uh, brief you about the findings uh, of the study in 2019, where we did the review and uh, the uh, implications uh, uh, of uh, harm reduction program uh, program in 2021 uh, there was uh, some research activities and uh, and uh, uh, economic and legal aspects of uh, harm reduction how uh, they can be introduced uh, uh, through some pictures uh, but uh, we have uh, mentioned several times uh, we are well aware of this uh, economically uh, both for the community for individuals for public health uh, it is uh, beneficial to introduce uh, the um, disaggregated or distinguished uh, taxes uh, uh, when we levy uh, the goods and products with uh, uh, larger and higher harms uh, with uh, higher taxes uh, and uh, uh, we can uh, reduce the consumption of uh, certain harmful products uh, thanks to some uh, higher taxation and uh, and also levied some harmful products uh, with uh, higher uh, taxes such as uh, tobacco and vodka, alcohol. And uh, I am more focused on tobacco, but uh, some conclusions uh, you can draw yourselves. And uh, very briefly, I can tell that this for the alcohol market, the uh, studies show there is a very direct link if uh, we buy the alcohol drinks, uh, less uh, less potent alcohol drinks, uh, um, beverages uh, at uh, lower prices. Uh, we solve the problem with the dependency, uh, uh, with the transition to uh, uh, lower alcohol content uh, drinks. Uh, uh, what uh, uh, we belong to Eurasian Economic Union, uh, in particular, we are in Kyrgyzstan, Armenia, Belarus, uh, uh, Russia, and Kazakhstan. And uh, uh, since 2012, we have our uh, efforts uh, to come up with the uh, single uh, agreement, uh, a single regulation of alcohol market in uh, uh, this EA EU market. Uh, and uh, there is an agreement on the unified tax policy uh, with regard to alcohol, with regard to tobacco. This is already the case. Uh, this is quite a serious step forward. Uh, and uh, Kinta has uh, already spoke about this. Uh, the health, uh, due to the risks uh, 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 by using the vehicles uh, with the uh, um, engines of internal combustion uh, compared to electric vehicles uh, if uh, uh, when it comes to alcohol and uh, it is globally known that harm reduction through uh, management decisions uh, of uh, government agencies related to differentiation of taxes uh, in particular excise taxes uh, when it comes uh, to uh, transport uh, and the motor vehicles uh, regulation of the government uh, varies. Uh, the, uh, the more uh, rapidly de uh, developing and developed countries in Europe, uh, they use the tax on fuel, unlike, uh, unlike the countries in EA, EU, where we use uh, traditional taxes on the um, capacity of the engine. and. Uh, and the most uh, environmentally clean is the approach of the European countries. And therefore, uh, back in 2022, there was a recommendation. Maybe we have to unify the approaches of EA, EU countries uh, in terms of uh, in terms of basic principle for taxation. Um, uh, uh, as for the tobacco, in many presentation, a lot has been said about this uh, scope of uh, a smoking, scale of smoking among children, among adult population, and the uh, counterfeit and the smuggled vapes and the other electronic uh, cigarettes, types of cigarettes, uh, but they uh, are showing the formidable picture. 
we have to go uh, to go for switching from uh, high harmful uh, products to less harmful products uh, and in this statistics uh, we rely on the researches and studies uh, conducted by WHO which uh, noted that the high uh, prevalence of tobacco products uh, and that conventional cigarettes in our countries uh, uh, is quite prevalent. Uh, uh, Russia is leading in that sense, uh, and the concept of harm reduction uh, to reduce the consumption of conventional cigarettes is a, a very important element here. And uh, even if we don't have economists here, the public health uh, uh, workers and the health workers and uh, NGOs uh, who are dealing with uh, people already exposed to risks uh, for the government and for uh, uh, for the um, rationale of the government to take actions in terms of harm reduction uh, concept. We have to provide the line of reasoning and uh, and uh talking uh, about the risks uh, with regard to tobacco products uh, for example leads uh, to the uh, costs uh, uh, to the cost of the budget uh, for treatment in terms of treatment of uh, uh, people with NCDs uh, because of uh, uh, using alcohol or uh, tobacco and the productivity goes down and uh, the uh, tax taxable base uh, uh, is reducing. And uh, we know all this. Uh, uh, and uh, there are statistical records about the crime rates and so on. We have to call our governments uh, to take actions. Uh, and they have, they are forced to take countermeasures, counter actions. And, uh, as for the decision making in Kazakhstan, the same in many other countries. In many other countries, uh, uh, we have uh, quite uh, uh, effective uh, efforts and actions. Uh, there are legislative acts and uh, legal regulations, uh, and they are already available in EEA, EU countries. Uh, uh, a regulation and stimulation of of, uh, uh, of products containing nicotine and uh, both uh, us uh, as part of the research and we approve uh, uh, the importance of these uh, things and we try to digitize this uh, the uh, researches in 2021 and researches in 2023 uh, speak to the fact that we have to adjust our actions because of the geopolitical situation the context has changed uh, drastically the economic uh, bonds and ties uh, uh, interrupted there are some economic issues uh, sanctions imposed on certain countries uh, EA, eu is uh, moving towards import substitution and uh, and uh, other ways of supporting the economies of their countries and uh, uh, this is about our futures future resources uh, um, to be spent on our control of ncds uh, I am the, uh, one of the authors of uh, uh, the group which developed the regulatory framework uh, uh, when uh, we started this uh, work back in uh, 2020 uh, uh, with a focus and emphasis on safety and, uh, and I would like to talk more about the recommendations and uh, uh, what uh, you have seen uh, on the slides uh, these are the parts of our legislation this is a completely new approach uh, with a focus and emphasis on safety and this is to do with uh, the introduction of the harm reduction concept uh, because harm reduction concept this is a issue of uh, safety and security economic uh, political and um, uh, the recommendation of 2022 uh, uh, were aimed to call upon uh, governments to take certain actions in order uh, to reduce the risks uh, differentiation of the taxes and rates of taxes in 2023 we have to focus uh, on cooperation in every country there are lots of happenings uh, and the 
conditions for work uh, related to harm reduction are improving and the professional performance is uh, outstanding but uh, uh, every year we raise these issues uh, and it is impossible impossible to tackle this issue in one single country and we have to consolidate and unite our efforts uh, and uh, today we have to have some appeal to EA, EU, that the key criteria in uh, taking economic decisions are the principles and concept of harm reduction. And moreover, this is uh, not uh, uh, the uh, a desire of economists. Uh, this is a normal situation when the government uh, takes a decision. Uh, they have to s assess the uh, 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 impact of the regulatory impact assessment. All countries engaged in reducing tax and banning some uh, shipments and uh, smuggling and so on. No one included the criteria how it uh, 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 it affects the harm reduction. I think it is very important important to highlight this. Uh, we talked about the role of NGOs uh, and uh, uh, experts and volunteers and other professionals. Uh, I think the government agencies uh, performance performance is a feeling not because of their bad skills but poor skills but because of the logistical chain is not supervised and followed up properly and we can help the organization in this research in order to come up with a proper and justified line of reasoning we have the norm of life and standards of life for each of us in each state thank you very much thank you very much for this great presentation and for highlighting the relationship between the health of the society and the health of economy we have some seven or eight minutes left so i would like to ask for questions from the audience now I know that everybody is already tired, but it is a last chance to ask questions. Yes, we got a question. Uh, dobré útra. Oi. So, it's not good morning, it's a good evening. I saw a about Baila again. I would like to specify, and these are two questions. Uh, I'm thankful to the last presentation. It was important uh, to highlight the role of the government. In new presentations, I would like also to see, or maybe now you can comment, how healthy lifestyle and how our everyday decisions made on a daily basis uh, uh, impact on the accessibility of the goods and items that we need and want, such as fruits, for example, to make uh, tobacco products more expensive, or for example, if we need to increase the physical activity, the gym uh, expenses uh, to be uh, cheaper, because uh, so far in Kyrgyzstan this is rather a luxury. Uh, and uh, also, so that was a collection of presentations, and it was of the recommendation nature, but also, uh, for example, we've seen that in the UK, similar study was conducted, and they were surprised to find out that the HIV-infected males uh, live longer than non-HIV infected males because having chronic diseases they would refer to the clinics more often and when it is needed to take the medical intervention then they will get it sooner while the healthy males would show up only before they die. So, excellent question uh, from you, the question number one. What to do when we ask this question, what to do? It is healthy, but it's expensive. 
And that is the idea of the public policy, public health policy, when the government uh, applies uh, only one sector specific concept, it doesn't change. Yes, you can work on a drug dependent separately or on TB separately, but if it's not integrating the economical part, uh, the economics and other areas of the governmental activities, so then it will not change. Yes, it's possible to make access to gym activities cheaper. And in Kazakhstan, we have the program to support businesses, which provides a minimal interest rate for certain types of businesses for example as a business company you want to build the gym facility then you can be entitled to such subsidies and grants from the government if you provide it for for the target audience thank you then I would like to answer in uh, relation to your very professional, very profound question. You've mentioned UK and uh, the study. Yes, uh, UK people, they are fan of the good quality studies. And unfortunately, when you apply them to those countries which were covered by my study, we had to use such variables as a relative risk, risk ratio. Taking them from the results of the cohorts that is done in UK or in US, wherever they were conducted, this resembles the situation when the man has lost the keys under the table but looks for the keys outside of the house because there is more light outside. So when we will get good quality cohort studies for Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan, we will be in a better position to specify such a data so this is the situation when we have to use those indicators which we have at our disposal and to answer to this question uh, regarding the comorbidity and the identification of comorbidity cases when you do the research on HIV in patients which is called as a sequela in the study language about it is taken into account in those countries where they do such studies like UK and then they extrapolate to those countries where such studies have not been conducted. Thank you. As to the first question, as to the economics of the harm reduction concept. Yes, harm reduction concept is more accessible to richer, to better off financial groups of the population. If we will apply in a breakdown to, to the, by the parts of the population which can afford it or cannot afford it, then we will have the limited area for studies. But for example, we can move from the uh, heavier alcohol drinks to the softer alcohol drinks, and this does not require some, you know, expensive uh, campaign. It can be done at the level of the PHC facilities. And in Kazakhstan, we reduced twice recently the production of the heavy alcohol drinks by increasing the production of wine and beer. The production has increased significantly at the same time. The consumption of the pure alcohol has reduced from 11 liters to 7 liters. Of course, yes, the religious factor has contributed to this reduction as well, but also taxation system has increased excise fees for vodka and for today the cost of vodka equals to the cost of cognac and before these prices were different and 
And for example, introducing some restrictions on the salt consumption, this requires only informational work, for example, to reduce the sugar containing products. Uh, there were articles uh, issued uh, in mass media about high consumption rate of sugarized products and we conducted a small study at the city clinic in Almaty and we identified that we had our own specifics with the age we are using yes less and less uh, sugarized drinks but uh, but you see, but you see with the age you have increased income rate and this is the reverse situation with the younger people but we have traditional drink of tea with milk and regardless of the age each person has a two uh, cups of traditional tea with two tablespoons of sugar and this here we have the potential intervention suggested to explain that it should be eliminated to reduce the rates of NCDs and the risk factors. So it's not about additional funding, but it's rather about additional information. Thank you very much. And since we have just run off time, I would like to ask everyone to thank our presenters. And what remains is our brief closing of the conference, so please don't disappear yet. <laughs> Thank you very much.